Strange the things you remember. Single images and feelings that stay with you down through the years. Hello friends and welcome or welcome back. I'm Shannon Makes, historical customer by day, circus artist by night. And this video will be about Claire Randall's magnificent blue coat from season one of Outlander and how I made my own version of it, but modified it to be suitable for the frigid hellscape that is winter in Montreal. This video will be vaguely divided into three sections. First, looking at the original coat and its features, then the process of making the coat, and finally reviewing both the pattern I used to make it, as well as the resulting garment that I ended up with. Now, I am a huge Outlander fan, at least of the first few seasons, and while I'm quite familiar with the coat in question, some of you might not be, so let's start by taking a look at those scenes and identifying what were the key features of the coat. As a quick bit of background, these scenes take place in 1946 in a freshly post-war Scotland. Right away, we can see that the coat is made from a fairly lightweight fabric with some great drape and movement. It's this lovely light blue color, and it's a very classic 1940s design with a lapel style collar and some gorgeous pleats in the back that add a fantastic movement to the coat. Above the pleats is a cute little half belt band, and that's mirrored by the same strip of fabric in the front with the buttons serving as the main closure for the coat. It's also got these very typical 1940s shoulders padded to the point where they'll probably stand up on their own and giving that classy boxy style that was very much in vogue. Beyond the information that we get from actually looking at the coat on screen and in motion, we also have a bonus resource which is the costume designer's blog. Terry Dresbach was the customer for the first four seasons of the show, and she has some notes on the coat along with this sketch and some of the period images and garments that inspired the design. We learn that the coat is made in a slate blue wool gabardine with a printed wool scarf, and since fabric was still rationed at that point in post-war Britain, her costumes were supposedly at least made to the standards set by the British government. And if you want to know more about that topic, So Biased has a great video on fashion and rations, which I'll be sure to link in the description. The coat is a midi length, falling roughly mid-calf, and has a curved slashed pocket, which is another feature which feels very vintage to me, but which I'm also not entirely in love with. Here are some similar garments that Terry referenced when designing the coat, and you can see several of the same elements repeated from the boxy shoulders to the lapel style collar. With these features in mind, the next step was to try and find a pattern that had a lot of these elements, and in my mind, the two most important ones were the pleats in the back and the lapel collar. Fortunately, I managed to find a pattern that was shockingly similar to this one. It's the Vera Venus 1940s copycat coat pattern, and it has the lapel collar, the back pleats, the miniature belt, and even the same rounded pockets. Now, originally, when writing this script, the pattern was no longer available. She had removed it from her website and closed down her store, but I'm happy to report that I reached out to her in anticipation of this video, and the pattern should be available for purchase, so if you also want to make your own version of Claire's coat, you can visit her Etsy store and get a copy. I'll make sure to put a link in the description. Hello, Editing Shannon here with a rather unfortunate update, which is that in the time since filming the previous section, the situation has changed, and due to some personal events in the designer's life, she was not able to get her Etsy store up and running before this video was released, so as of now, the pattern is not available, but she does definitely hope to get it up eventually, and I will be sure to update the description with the link once it is available. Alright, back to the rest of the video. 
So with the pattern in hand, I next needed some fabric. And while I loved the look and drape of the wool gabardine, I also knew that I wanted to be able to wear this coat in a majority of the winter here in Montreal, which meant that I needed it to be good down to at least minus 15. And wool gabardine just wasn't going to cut it. So in the end, I ended up going with a thicker wool in an indigo herringbone that is just gorgeous. It's a bit darker than Claire's original on-screen coat, but I found it was a much richer color than the lighter, more screen accurate option that was available to me. It's got all these small flecks of sky blue, green, and purple running through it that make the color just so deep and visually intriguing. With the main fabric chosen, I then purchased some lining and I went with this amazing rich purple Bemberg, which not only adds a fun flash of color, but I also think it really pulls out some of the purple fibers from the outside wool. Next up was the tailoring materials because a proper 40s coat is going to require some internal structure and that list included canvas, interfacing, tailoring canvas, and interlining. The plain canvas and the interfacing are pretty standard materials, so instead I'll focus on the other two. For the tailoring canvas, I literally just walked into my local tailoring shop, which I recently learned has been in business since 1780, and I asked what they recommended I would use. They sent me home with a large chunk of this. I don't even know what the exact name of it is, but it's a fairly loose weave chest canvas that's quite flexible in one direction, a bit stiffer in the other, and just helps add some overall structure to the coat. Next, let's talk about the interlining. Unlike interfacing, which is generally used in small areas like the cuff and the collar, interlining is often an entire panel cut in a separate layer of fabric and used to add warmth rather than structure. I happened to get mine from a couple of recycled soft shell jackets, but common materials for interlining and the ones recommended in the instructions for this pattern include lightweight thinsulate, lamb's wool, or cotton flannel. And I will say that I did use some flannel on the sleeves just to cut down on the bulk. Now this coat was a pandemic project well before I started YouTube, so I don't have a full set of progress photos and videos, but I do have some, so we'll be using those as well as the actual garment to walk through how I made up this coat and what tips I have for those of you who would like to make a similar one. And if you'd like a more in-depth examination of the coat, I've got a lengthy vlog post up on my coffee page. It's available to all monthly supporters and it has construction photos, photos of the finished jacket and the final pattern pieces that I wound up with, as well as details on how various sections are constructed and more. The link to that will be in the description below if you'd like to check it out. So first off, I started with a mock-up. I knew I was probably going to be making multiple mock-ups to get this pattern just right before I committed to cutting into what was definitely the most expensive fabric I've ever purchased. Right away, I suspected that I was going to change the front of the coat and the whole pocket situation, but for that first mock-up, I did the pattern exactly as it was designed, which is that the front is made up of two separate pieces, with the curved pocket being sort of the dividing line between the two panels. And here is the very casual video from the fitting of that first mock-up. It does look a bit loose, especially in the arms, but that's fine since I didn't actually have all the correct layers on underneath. So the fit was pretty good, but as suspected, I did not love those pockets, even though they're screen accurate, and I decided it would be far more elegant if I modified the front of the coat to have some long princess seams and then use those new seam lines to make some invisible inseam pockets. Then I made a second mock-up with the adjusted pattern, and for that I upgraded to using an old blanket because it had a similar weight and hand to my wool, so I could check not only the fit but also the drape of the mock-up and just see how everything was hanging. In fact, we can see that in the first one I took the time to cut and sew the facing for the lapels, but that on the second one I didn't even bother since I hadn't touched that part of the pattern. I also apparently wasn't wasting time sewing on a second sleeve either. 
This is not a great video, but we can still learn a few things from it. First of all, we can see that this time I am wearing the proper layers underneath it. This black jacket is my light winter jacket under which I can comfortably wear a sweater and a long sleeve shirt. And you can see that the sleeve does look much more filled out and properly sized than in the first video. Secondly, I can see that I needed to true up the length of the front hem compared to the back hem, but that was easy to do. And lastly, and perhaps most importantly, we can see that the princess seam conversion was successful and that the front of the jacket still fits well, but no longer has the curved and visible pocket on the outside. So that was enough to convince me that the main parts of the jacket were the right size, and now I could start patterning out some of the finer details and changes I wanted. And I will admit that while most of them were patterned well ahead of time, some of them were designed much later on once I got to that particular step of the process, and I was sure I understood what the pattern was actually doing. Do I recommend that you proceed like this? I mean, Maybe, but not necessarily. I'm a fairly adventurous and competent sewist, so I feel comfortable working like this. Plus, I also had enough fabric that if I made a mistake on a small part like a facing or a belt, I'd have enough to correct for that error. But if you prefer caution or you're newer to sewing, then I definitely recommend testing all additional changes and pattern pieces on a mock-up before proceeding. Let me know in the comments below what style sewist you are. Do you like the pattern to be perfected ahead of time, or are you comfortable working a bit more on the fly? So what changes was I making to the pattern? Well, first of all, I wanted a hidden zipper instead of visible buttons because it's faster to put on and better at keeping out the cold breeze. Secondly, I wanted a hood, or rather, I wanted the option to have a hood if it was cold enough or actively snowing, but I also wanted to be able to have the more strictly vintage plain lapel collar look if I wanted, so I decided to make it removable. And lastly, some minor aesthetic changes, but I wanted cuffs on the sleeves and I wanted the belt to be an actual belt made in one continuous piece that wrapped all the way around my torso and fastened in the front. So I patterned all these pieces out and I'll go through that all in my blog post, but next I finally broke out the wool and started cutting out the pieces. And let me just preface this photo by saying that this was a project that I really wanted to take my time on and enjoy the process. I wanted a final garment that fitted well and lasted a long time, so I went all out. Like, this is fully overkill and not necessary, but I chucked out the pieces and then thread marked them all too. I definitely wish now that I had better pictures, but we're stuck with some pretty potato quality visual aids, and for that I apologize. So I cut everything out, I thread marked all the pieces, and then I started attaching the chest canvas. Now, I should note that it's often recommended to pre-shrink your canvas by spritzing it with water and then steam ironing it, but I tested that technique out on a small swatch of mine and it didn't shrink at all, so I decided to skip that step. So to insert the canvas, I first laid it out, then set the pre-cut wool pieces on top of it and basted the canvas to the wool. This just held it temporarily in place and kept the correct tension so that I could then go back and basically pad stitch the canvas permanently to the wool. I don't know if it's actually called pad stitching when the goal is not to create shaping and structure, but I still think it's the right term. If you're a tailor, definitely let me know down in the comments if there is in fact a better word for this. But basically with each stitch I was sewing through the canvas and then catching just a tiny amount of the wool, so little that ideally it wasn't visible from the front of the fabric, and just doing lots and lots of long lines of that to keep the canvas in place and give the wool some additional structure and body. You can see the pad stitching better in this photo here in those long lines of vertical stitches. 
Then, once all the canvas was inserted, I went through and used a catch stitch to tack the seam allowances down on either side of my seam, holding them flat and keeping them from fraying. Then, the last thing to tackle on the front of the coat was the lapels, which were pad stitched by hand to give some nice shaping, and if you look closely, you can actually see the first couple rows of pad stitching on each lapel, and it's clearly doing its job because even though the rest of the coat panel is hanging flat and straight, the lapels want to remain flipped into the inside. There are plenty of resources online about pad stitching and how to do it, so I'm not going to go into it in depth here, but I will say I highly recommend it. It's both pretty easy and wonderfully effective. I was really concerned about the wool stretching out in the back because it had to carry the weight of all those pleats, which even though I didn't add any canvas to them, they still ended up being pretty darn heavy. Now, I might have gone a little overboard with this, but once the back panel was assembled, I first applied a very sturdy fusible interfacing to the entire upper back area, stopping at the top of the pleats, and then I additionally added a back stay made out of a normal canvas, plus I added a line of twill tape into the seams of both the shoulders and where the pleats attach to the back of the jacket. I really wanted to be sure that nothing stretched out over time. The back stay, which is the purple bit here, stabilizes the armholes and the upper back of the coat so the fabric stays in its original shape. And the pattern didn't come with a separate piece for this, but it does have a shaded guideline so that you can use the pattern pieces to make your own stay if you want to. As a rather unrelated sidebar, Outlander was actually what got me interested in historical costuming in the first place. I had found the first book in one of those little free libraries while on contract in 2019 and got hooked. I then quickly got my hands on all the other books in the series, literally hauling at least four of them overseas with me to Denmark, where I voraciously tore through those as well. Somewhere along the way, I learned that the books had been turned into a TV series, and there were four whole seasons to binge. To this day, I find it pretty funny that that was my gateway into the world of historical costuming, even though I haven't really even considered making anything 18th century for the channel. What about you? Do you have as clean and clear of an origin story for your interest in historical fashion? Or are you just here because you're an Outlander fan and have no real interest in historical costuming outside of that universe? Let me know down below. I always enjoy hearing your stories. So with the canvas in the front and the back reinforced, I sewed the pleated section into position. The pleats on this pattern are a bit unusual in that they're cut in six separate pieces and then sewn together and attached to a center back pleat, and then they're pressed in place along the fold line, and the instructions suggested using lots of steams as well as a dauber and clapper. Now, having just moved to a new continent, at that point I did not have a clapper on hand, so I used a pile of books set on a thick towel to hold the pleats firmly in place while they cooled. This is pretty essential to setting those pleats, especially if you're working with a thicker wool that needs a bit of convincing, let's say, to hold those pleats. I do have a few more tips on pressing pleats into stubborn wool, but for the sake of time, I'm just going to go ahead and throw those right in the blog post. So now the pleats were in the back and it was looking something like this. And I remember sewing this stitch line about 15 times or so because I really, really didn't want those stitches snapping. Next, the back and the front were sewn together and Phil snapped this oh-so-charming photo of me impatiently trying the jacket on even though the side seams weren't even sewn up yet. I just literally couldn't wait to see what it looked like, so I just popped it on and I'm kind of glad that he did take this picture because if we zoom in, we can actually see the inside of the lapels and all of the pad stitching that went into them and how it makes them just hold their shape super well. And here is another shot of the pad stitching, this time hanging on a mannequin backstage because I think at this point I was working on the sleeve and the cuff. The cuff was definitely one of those things that I waited a while to pattern out because I wasn't 100% sure what I wanted to do with them and I wanted to try out some various options on the sleeve itself before committing to a pattern. 
I also lined the entire torso with the soft shell jacket fabric, which was seam ripped from its original shape and shamelessly pieced together to fit the new pattern. And I don't remember exactly how far down the interlining extends, but I do know it definitely covers my entire torso. At some point, and I'm a bit fuzzy on the order because, like I said, this was three years ago at this point, the lining was cut out from that fantastic purple fabric and sewn together using the exact same pattern pieces as the body of the coat. If you were with me for my very first Cape Timber sew along, you'll maybe remember that I like to cut my lining full sized using the same pattern pieces as the fashion fabric and then trim them back as I go. I found this worked especially well in this project because if I'm being quite honest, I wasn't super good about chewing up my final pattern pieces with all of the changes I made. And so I wasn't 100% sure where to cut the lining in order to make it meet perfectly with the facings. So I highly recommend this technique if your final pattern pieces are a little bit chaotic. But before the lining was sewn in, there were a few last steps to do on the outside of the coat, one important one being the installation of some pockets. And these were just installed into the princess seam of the coat, and they are quite literally invisible when I'm wearing it, even when they're full of stuff. So I'm super pleased with that decision. I think it turned out really well and much more elegant than the original curved design. Also, I didn't want to have a zipper that extended lower than I could comfortably reach because I already have one winter jacket like that and it honestly drives me nuts every time I go to zip it up. So instead, I measured how far down I could comfortably reach a zipper and then to help keep the rest of the bottom portion of the coat closed, I inserted a small but incredibly strong magnet into the bottom of the coat. It's about six inches farther down than the bottom of the zipper and it's enough that it keeps the coat closed in most normal circumstances. It's an incredibly practical feature and I'm almost sad that it's so invisible. So that pretty much covers the front of the coat. The other major alteration that I made was to add a hidden zipper into the collar. So here, if you pop the collar up, you can see I have one half of a zipper in there and then the other half of the zipper is in the hood and on really cold, windy days or if it's snowing a lot, I can just attach the hood and it's super cute and practical. But then on a more moderate day, I can stick with the strictly vintage on-screen look. I patterned the hood out myself. It's a three panel design and it's lined in the same purple fabric as the rest of the coat. The fur is actually real fur. I salvaged it from a cap that I found at a thrift store and I absolutely love the contrast that the white fur makes against the blue wool. Plus, if you've ever lived in a really cold climate, you probably know just how much having a nice furry hood helps in cutting down the wind and sort of keeping your face in a warm bubble of air. Warm being, of course, a relative term. So with all those little features added to the coat, I then inserted the lining, which was a bit of a rodeo because as previously stated, you know, I was a bit sloppy with my final pattern pieces. So I literally just had to lay the lining in the coat and line up the pleats and all of the seam lines and sort of smooth the lining out and pin it down where it met the facing and then sew it in like that. The last steps were installing a back facing and a coat hanging loop and then and working on the hem, and then it was done. So now that you've seen how I made my coat and how it turned out, I thought I'd give you my thoughts on the final product I made. Am I happy with it? What would I change? And is there anything I'd do differently? But before I get into it, I'd like to hear from you about what your favorite feature of this coat is. Is it the voluminous pleats, the practical and cozy hood, the secret magnet? Let me know down in the comments. Let's see which feature is the most popular. So as I said from the start, I really wanted this to be a slow, take your time and enjoy the process type project. And I really think it shows because I am so happy with the fit and the craftsmanship behind it. The fit is absolutely on point while still allowing for a surprising amount of flexibility in what I wear underneath it. 
I can load it up with enough layers that I am comfortable in at least minus 25, but I've also worn it comfortably with significantly fewer layers in more like plus 10, and it looks good in both situations. The only thing I will note is that the design of this collar with the lapels means that the top section right at the neck here is quite open. So when it's cold outside, I do have to make sure to wear a nice thick scarf to sort of fill in that gap. But even on the coldest days, that's been enough for me personally. Plus it is technically screen accurate. The pleats are absolutely gorgeous and definitely my favorite feature of the jacket. Also, this coat has seen some shit and it still manages to look just great. I do my best to hang it up on a hanger whenever possible, but it's also been tromping through forests, it's been balled up and jammed in overhead compartments on airplanes, it's served as a blanket to keep me from freezing on trains, and in the three years I've owned it, I have yet to iron it since making it, and it still somehow looks fantastic. Now, would it look a bit sharper if I did press it? For sure. But I thought I'd point out that, at least in the fabric that I ended up choosing, this coat is fairly low maintenance. Also, this pattern is my perfect length. It's long enough for some serious swish and drama, but it's just short enough that I can walk around and climb up and down steps and not worry about it getting in my way or tripping over it or having it drag in the mud and snow. If I could go back in time and change anything, I do have a couple small things that I would change, and one is that I'd add maybe in half an inch or so of length to the cuff because they're technically long enough, but I think I would like it if they were just a smidge longer. A couple things that I still need to do is to go in and prick stitch the pocket lining down. I used a cotton remnant for the lining because I thought that the tartan pattern was a nice little nod to Outlander and the origins of the coat, but that fabric isn't as slippery as a traditional lining, so it does tend to get pulled out a little bit when I'm taking things out of my pocket. Plus, I also want to add a little arrowhead tack here to reinforce the bottom of the opening, and lastly, I need to commit to a closure method for my belt because after three years I am still safety pinning it closed. Let me know down in the comments how you think I should close my coat. The criteria for this are that it should be fitting with the overall aesthetic of the coat and it should be adjustable depending on how many layers I have underneath without necessarily broadcasting that it's adjustable. So no hooks and eyes peeking out when I've got all my layers on, that sort of thing. Seriously though, I'm super happy with this coat. Next to my patchwork house coat, this is the garment that I am the most proud of. I had never done any of these tailoring techniques before, and so I definitely had to do a lot of research for several steps of the process. So it's not something that if you're looking for, say, a quick and easy project, it's maybe not the thing for you. You can't just turn your brain off and sew. But if you don't mind taking the time to invest in learning some new skills, it's a wonderful garment. And now I can prance around Montreal in my very own replica-ish Outlander coat. If you'd like to see me actually make something rather than simply talking about it, I'd highly recommend my adjustable waistband skirt. And remember that if you'd like even more details on the coat, its construction, or the final pattern pieces that I ended up with, I'll have that blog available on Coffee for all monthly supporters. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you in my next video.